Yes, thank you. We did focus on that issue in our written testimony. Just in the interest of time, I didn't go into it in my, in my summary. But we have, and I did address this last year, a growing and increasing number of people over 50 years old who are um, requiring more and more medical care. It costs approximately $60,000 a year to maintain someone under 40 in the DOC system, but as they get older, that, that cost, because of medical expense, goes up as high as $240,000, $260,000 a year. We have not enough medical beds available for those people who are in need of significant cognitive medical care, and we know that those people, by and large, do not present any concern for public safety, and therefore the more humane and economically intelligent thing to do would be to move them out of the DOC system. They could be paroled and maintained in the community. We have approximately 9,000 people in the current system who are over 50 years of age, and that number is growing faster than any other segment of our prison population. Somewhere in the report that I think I read that is um, over 78 percent of the people incarcerated are over the age of 50. That's a tremendous number. It is. Um, and the other quick thing that I wanted before my time runs out is to talk about the fact that um, the evaluation, when they come up for parole, they're denied release time and time, time and again due to the immutable factor, the nature of offense for which the person has been convicted. Yes. Help many, me with that one as well. Many, many of the people who we find in our system who are 50 years of age and older are um, serving long sentences and when they become parole eligible and having commit, um, completed all the programming that's been required of them, they're being denied parole, even though they have a low risk assessment score over and over again because of the nature of their crime. It's one thing that they can't change any more than any of us can change our date of birth. And so you find people who've been denied seven, eight, nine, and ten times um, from being released on parole despite the fact that they haven't had no disciplinary problems for many, many years and their risk assessment score is very low. I just want to um, take my couple of seconds to thank you, number one, for your diligence and, and the work that you've done on behalf of our corrections system. And, you know, there's always this sense that we care more about the prisoners than we do the people who work there. But it's absolutely not true. I think it's as important for us to um, distinguish at this budgetary time the importance of both and how the care of, um, if we want to be considered a humane society, that, that our prisons is the place to begin. And I, I thank you again. Do more. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Our next speakers are from Prisoners Legal Services, and we have Karen Murtaugh, Executive Director, Thomas Curran, member of the Board of Directors, and John Dunn, also a member of the board of directors, except we're missing one. Yeah. Okay, he escaped. <laughs> well, thank you for sticking it out, and welcome tonight. I look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Um, I think Again, uh, uh, it is quite thick, so if you could summarize, that oh, would be helpful. No problem at all. Uh, that's our plan. Um, John uh, Dunn did apologize for not being able to be here this evening. He was here until about 5.30, but... His uh, wife summoned him home. We saw, we did <laughs> see him. Mine has summoned me home, but I, yet I remain. He, he told me he was under house arrest, which was... Yes, well, he I'm was cited in the building, and we did, we did see Jen Dunn, so thank you very much. Um, so um, uh, my board member, Tom Curran, is going to, to begin. Uh, the basic mission um, of Prisoners Legal Services is to assure, or to try to assure, that New York's prisons are as humane as they can and should be. There's not a frivolous thing about it. This is not a starry-eyed lot. The prisoner's legal board, PLS's board consists of former prosecutors, judges, defense lawyers, general practitioners, mental health professionals, and former legislators. Uh, PLS is dedi it's dedicated and extremely hardworking. I've seen this staff and its board. Um, the board. Uh, 
votes with its wallet. We, we actually actively support this organization. Uh, we don't believe in the abolition of prisons, um, uh, but we believe in making them better. Um, and uh, we, the fundamental uh, belief is that it is incongruous for the criminal justice system to take away a person's liberty for violating perceived and, and acceptable norms of conduct only to incarcerate them in settings that themselves do not fully uphold basic social norms and standards of justice. Among other ills, we believe that uh, such a syst systemic failure contributes to the scourge of recidivism and represents an ongoing threat to the safety of our communities. Also, PLS works, we believe, with uh, docs in order to make our prisons better and make them better places for the docs personnel to work. And I think that Karen's going to educate you on that, too. And I'm out. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, as all of you know, uh, the five of you that are left, um, PLS was created in 1976 uh, as, a, as a number one post-Attica reform. Uh, fast forward to today, we have four offices across the state when we used to have seven. We have 15 attorneys when we used to have 50. Um, our attorneys have to provide uh, civil legal services to over 52,000 prisoners in 54 prisons located across the state. Tom mentioned that we are a partner with the Department of Corrections. We are a critical partner with not only DOCS, but with the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. Um, with DOCS, over the past several years, we've created the Albion telephone program, so uh, women prisoners can call PLS for assistance. Uh, we have uh, worked with them to create a re-entry video, which is shown at reception to all incoming prisoners. Um, we have worked with the executive and DOB on both um, encouraging prisoners to apply for Medicaid and on the executive's uh, clemency efforts. We also work with the judiciary. The Court of Appeals reaches out to us time and time again to take cases that it has granted leave to appeal in. Last year we accepted uh, at least three cases. Um, and we work closely with the legislature. Um, a number of you send us letters that you receive from your constituents concerned about loved ones in prison, and we follow up on those letters and, and um, help to resolve those issues. Um, but the most um, telling about PLS's role, partnership role, is what happened this past summer with Clinton's escape. Um, after the escape happened, um, family members contacted PLS frantic because they could not find what happened to their loved ones at Clinton. They called Clinton, they tried to visit, there was a lockdown, nobody could get in. Nobody was giving them any information. I contacted both the executive and Tony Anucci. We worked together for PLS to put together a notice that we put on our Facebook page and our web page telling all the family members what was going on, when the lockdown was going to be lifted, what meals were being served, um, letting them know that medical care was being given. So many things that they were worried about that we were able to calm their fears about, which in turn results in calming the tension of the prison. And if you look back at what happened at Attica, and you look back at what we were able to do this summer to calm those tensions, it is like night and day. That is why PLS is so important. Um, we also were asked to go to Clinton with Assemblyman O'Donnell and um, Assemblyman Dupree and meet with the Inmate Liaison Committee to discuss their complaints about what was going on at Clinton. We met with them and then we met with the superintendent and we shared those complaints and we worked through many of those issues. Um, in the interest of time, I just want to say um, I'm here today to ask the legislature to add money to the appropriation in the executive budget. Governor Cuomo put us in the budget for $2.2 million. I'm asking the legislature to add $1.3 million. Last, le last year you added $1.2 million. Um, I'm asking for that ad because we have been grossly underfunded for the past 16 years, and even though we do 
a fabulous job. We cannot do the job the state has tasked us to do without additional funding. Thank you very much. You won't regret funding this organization. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you staying so late, and thank you for your valuable testimony. Thank Thanks you. for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, Executive Director Paige Pierce, Families Together in New York State Incorporated. And following Executive Director Pierce, there's Terry O'Neill, Director of the Constantine Institute. So if you could get ready. Hi, thank you so much for staying. I know it's been a long day for you. I appreciate it. It's been a long day for you. So we appreciate you too. Um, as CEO of Families Together in New York State, a nonprofit parent run organization serving families of youth with social, emotional, and behavioral challenges, I've dedicated my career to serving our state's most, most vulnerable citizens, connecting them with community based supports, and advancing sound social welfare policies in response to family identified needs. As such, we've been advocating for juvenile justice reforms, specifically legislation to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 16 to 18. As you're well aware, New York State continues to be only one of two states that automatically prosecutes and incarcerates 16 and 17 year olds as adults. Upon arrest, they are interrogated without so much as a call to their parents, charged and incarcerated with adult population in the local jail while awaiting trial. Uh, should they be found guilty, they're incarcerated with the adult prison population where they are five times more likely to be sexually assaulted, two times more likely to be injured by prison staff, and five times more likely to complete suicide than if they were in a juvenile facility. They're also more likely to recidivate upon release, do so at a higher level, and perpetuate public safety concerns. While the governor recently issued an interim measure, executive order, that will no longer allow for incarceration of youth in adult uh, facilities, the measure does not reach out to um, county jails. For the last two years, I've shared stories of our children whose lives have been destroyed or even ended. Um, I have them in my written testimony, and I won't um, read them all now, but if I would really encourage you to read them. There's stories like Ben Van Zant and Khalif Browder, who are no longer with us. Um, they were both um, teenagers and arrested and imprisoned with the adult population, and both took their own lives. Throughout the time span of these horror stories, I, along with other advocates, have been here in Albany attempting to advance systemic reforms. Given the fact that I'm here before you yet again this year, it leads to one to beg the question, how many more children will be irrevocably harmed or lose, lost before we implement reforms. As you're aware, the governor again included in his executive budget proposal a comprehensive Smart on Crime initiative that allows us to keep intact a strong response to violent offenses and cost-effective evidence-based diversion reforms that will result in a higher level of public protection. Over the course of the past several weeks, We've met with several legislators, and uh, similar to last year, the response has been positive regarding Raise the Age, with some concerns raised as well, related mostly to the violent, uh, violent offenses and a misguided notion that we are suggesting youth convicted of crimes such as murder or rape will be slapped on the wrist and forgiven. <clears throat> that is not now, nor has it ever been the position of the Raise the Age advocates nor has it ever been reflected in, in the many bills drafted. Under the current proposed language, these youth would still be processed through the adult court system with stiff sen sentencing. The difference is that they would not be remanded to an adult facility until they're indeed an adult. And they would be given the appropriate services while incarcerated. It is, however, important to remember that such heinous crimes are an infinitesimally small percentage of the crimes committed by youth. The majority of, of initial crimes committed by youth are much less serious, but despite evidence to the contrary, we continue to prosecute and, in many instances, incarcerate them as adults. In one study, the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Adolescent Development and Juvenile Justice examined the effectiveness of prosecuting teens as adults 
by comparing New York teens with teens in New Jersey. In New York, juveniles as young as 13 can be charged in an adult court, while in New Jersey, most juvenile offenders under the age of 18 are processed in juvenile court. When comparing youth arrested in the same felony charges in New York and New Jersey, data showed that adolescents processed in New York adult courts were more likely to be rearrested, they were rearrested more often and more quickly and for more, more serious offenses, and they were reincarcerated at higher rates than those in New Jersey juvenile courts. This is not a smart on crime approach, nor is it one that takes public safety in, into consideration. We heard earlier stories of violent crimes committed by recent parolees. We are producing these adult criminals by sending our children to adult prisons. We've also heard concerns about costs. While there's a modest upfront capital cost associated with imprisonment, the overall results are expected to decrease costs. As Sophia Elijah stated earlier, um, Connecticut um, was a recent uh, state to implement Raise the Age, and they've seen costs go down significantly. And I talk about that more in my written testimony. So again, we contend that the fears are unlikely to be realized. The evidence is over overwhelmingly demonstrates that our current model in New York State is archaic in its design, ineffective as a deterrent model, and exorbitantly costly. Renowned neuroscientists, respected researchers, and even our nation's Supreme Court have all registered concerns and recommended that we utilize the wide breadth of evidence to build a better system. It's time we heeded this advice. I urge you to lead New York down a path of reform in 2016. Last year, I left you with a quote from uh, Maya Angelou that says, when you know better, we do better. As I noted then, we know better, and as a result, we need to do better. This year, I'll suggest we ponder the words of Mahatma Gandhi. There is a higher court than courts of justice, and that is the court of conscience. It supersedes all other courts. We cannot, in good conscience, leave this issue unattended again this session. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Director Terry O'Neill from the Constantine Institute, Incorporated. And then our final speaker will be Ann Erickson, CEO of the Empire Justice Center. Welcome. Thank you for your kind welcome, and thank you for your patience and forbearance this evening. I've been attending these meetings for over 30 years, so I know what you're going through. Uh, and obviously, the prepared room, uh, statement that I gave you is not something I'm going to attempt, even though I'd like to dazzle Mr. O'Donnell with uh, some real speed reading. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go over um, about three items that are in our program. Uh, the one that is most uh, timely and uh, important is, uh, you know, we're all aware uh, across the nation, and notwithstanding, as Mr. Green said today, that crime continues to go down in New York. And as uh, Commissioner Nucci told us, uh, our prison population has been steadily shrinking. But out in the streets and neighborhoods in this state and all over the nation, there's been an eruption of public dissatisfaction with the kind of policing services that people are getting. And we all know the stories that have been in the news in the last couple years. So <clears throat> our uh, prescription for dealing this, with this is the concept of community policing, which has been around for over 25 years, and which uh, was derailed here in New York in 1994 when Bill Bratton took over the New York City Police Department and started American policing down the road of data-driven policing. So now, all across the nation, police chiefs and mayors are pointing to their downward trending statistics as evidence that everything is just fine when we're hearing from people who have to live under these policing tactics that they don't like being treated like dots on one of Bill Bratton's crime maps. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't have this kind of management tool, but uh, it has to be balanced by uh, some investment in, in restarting the community policing movement that's been, you know, we've lost uh, total momentum on that. And I think that uh, Mr. McDonald here and, and Pat Fahey can tell you that here in Albany, our police department over the past six years or so has gone down the road of, of recovering that community policing spirit many miles. 
And all you have to do is you know, in, in, introduce yourself to uh, how policing is being provided in our neighborhoods with neighborhood engagement units and a, a citizen organization that interacts with the police on these issues on a, co a continuing basis. <clears throat> so um, you may have heard last week that our mayor got shouted down by people from the Black Lives uh, Matter movement uh, and they've called for our police chief to be fired. Uh, they're mistaken. You know, things are going better here in Albany than anywhere else, although last year we had an incident that upset many people. <clears throat> now, uh, I uh, was reading the other day the report that the, uh, this, the Assembly Minority put out on a heroin addiction tour of uh, hearings, and one thing that jumped out at me, uh, and Mr. Giglio tells me that he heard this at every venue they went on in their seven uh, hearing tour, is that there is a, a big hole in our prevention uh, program. We do not have a program that uh, credibly reaches an audience of high school age kids. Uh, the whole philosophy behind the D.A.R.E. program is just inappropriate for their, their way of thinking and accepting things. So what, we are, uh, what experts are telling us is that what will work is a peer-to-peer -peer approach where you, you uh, en enlist kids in, um, in school bodies to take the, on the responsibility of you know, take, uh, carrying the message to their schoolmates. And I have found a program uh, that, is, that is doing exactly that. It's called Mentor International. It was founded by the Queen of Sweden in 1994. And six years ago, uh, Mentor opened an office in Washington, D.C. and started networking in schools in the D.C. metropolitan area. And I've been determined to introduce this program to New York. And I was very happy in November when a foundation headquartered in Columbia County came up with the money to offer this program in three public schools in Columbia County. I attended two of them. And I can tell you that it went over very, very well with the kids. And what happens is they come in and do workshops and identify kids that have been pre-selected by the teachers uh, who would be likely to participate well in this program. Uh, they develop a program that's offered at a school-wide rally the next day, and after the rally on the third day, the mentor staff start sitting down with these kids and giving them training so that they can replicate this program on their own uh, in their school and in their community because it also involves um, a linkage with uh, uh, the business community to create mentoring opportunities for kids in the community. So I have those. There's one other thing that's in there. You know, on my written testimony, there is appended a draft of a bill that I've been promoting for quite a number of years. Uh, the bill would create a new program at the state university focusing on transnational organized crime. It doesn't interfere or conflict with anything else that the university is doing on homeland security or management or uh, emergency disaster preparedness. It's something quite different and it comes uniquely out of the history of the state police and its pioneering uh, exposure of the existence of the mafia back in 1957. They had quite a record of achievement, and their, the late superintendent, Tom Constantine, uh, is credited with having brought down, uh, from the time he was field commander in 1985, through his years at the DEA, the Cali cartel, the largest drug, drug car, uh, conspiracy in history. And then he went on to Northern Ireland and helped end three decades of terrorist violence there. So this, this is a whole story that comes out of the very personality and character of our state police. And as their anniversary is next year, I'd like to bring this proposal out into the open and make it a gift to the men and women of the state police. So with that being said, thank you again for your thank time. You, thank you, Director O'Neill. Thank you for your perseverance. <laughs> and our final speaker of the night, um, last but not least, is Ann Erickson, CEO of the Empire Justice Center. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And, um, as usual, I admire the stamina. I'm not sure if I was quite last last year, but uh, close to it. So thank you very much. Um, my name is Ann Erickson. I'm president and CEO of the Empire Justice Center. Um, we are a statewide organization that provides training, support, and technical assistance. We're basically the backup center for the civil legal services side. Um, we engage in legislative and administrative advocacy, and we provide direct representation um, in one of our four offices around the, or in our four offices around the state in Rochester, Albany, Westchester, and out on Long Island. 
So again, thank you. I, you've heard a lot today about the judicial um, investment in civil legal services, and I just wanted to provide a little bit of context. You have my testimony. I'm not going to go through that. But when the uh, task force to expand access to legal services, which is now the Judicial Commission on Access to Justice, first started operating in 2009, one of the things they did was take a look at where are we in New York State in terms of access to justice on the civil side. And what we found was that for those households on incomes at or below 200% of poverty, nearly half of them, three million people, experienced at least one civil legal need each year. 1.2 million of them had three or more incidences where they needed civil legal assistance. And what are these kinds of needs? We're talking about housing, we're talking about evictions, we're talking about foreclosures, we're talking about income supports, we're talking about health care, disability, um, we're looking at families, at the elderly, at the disabled, at veterans, at low-income homeowners, all of our constituents across the state, low, moderate income households who come up against the civil legal services system in ways that many of us do not. You know, they just confront issues that are driven by their poverty and by their economic fragility. We, at that point, we were meeting about 20% of the legal needs of the poor and low-income households. The investment by the judiciary in civil legal services has, has made a tremendous difference. We are now meeting, as we heard earlier today from Judge Marx, about 30% of the civil legal needs of low- and moderate-income households in this state. We've made progress. 70% of the civil legal needs of our constituents are still not being met. We have a long way to go, so this is really, we are making inroads, but we are nowhere near where we need to be. I also wanted to touch on the impact on the courts. Um, we heard very powerful testimony earlier today and this evening um, from the court clerks and from the court officers about the impact on, from their perspective on the courts, and I, I am with them. Um, but when we first looked at what was happening on the civil side of the court system, 2.3 million litigants were coming into civil court unrepresented on an annual basis. 2.3 million people walking into civil court without the benefit of counsel, about to lose their home, having lost their health care, having been denied unemployment, having had any array of issues that come at them. Um, we are, again, have made some inroads. 1.8 million people are now in front of our civil courts unrepresented, down from 2.3 million, still a long way to go. So as you deliberate this budget, and I know there's a lot of pressure from a lot of different areas, this is an investment we need to make and we need to continue and hold strong to that commitment. It's the first time that New York State has really looked at the civil legal needs um, side of the equation in any systemic way since I've been around and I've been doing this, I hate to say, for 26 years. So we can't stand still, we can't walk backwards, we're finally where we need, on the path that we should be on. I also just wanted to mention the distribution of the funding. I have to really give the court, um, a, the OCA, a lot of credit because what they did is they distributed the funding based by, on judicial department, based on the number of households under 200% of the poverty. Very equitable distribution across the state. I represent programs outside of New York City. I'm always afraid, you know, it's all going to go to the city. That has not happened. Um, it has really gone where the need is. And then I would also just say on the um, economic impact in my testimony, you have um, information drawn from the most recent commission report, and they're estimating that every dollar invested in civil legal services draws back in about $10 into the New York State economy. So it's a good investment. It's a just investment. I would urge you to keep working with us as we're finally on the path we need to be on in New York State. And with that, I thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. We're full circle. We started with the subject today. See? Clean up, Peter. Thank you guys very much. So thank you, Ann. Um, that concludes our public hearing, joint public hearing on public protection and the New York State budget proposal. And I want to thank all of my diehard colleagues for staying so late yet again tonight.
And I'd also like to thank all of the participants for hanging in there with us, so, and the staff too, so thank you very much.